Morning, and I'm calling to order the meeting of the City of Emeryville as successor to the Emeryville Redevelopment Agency. Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Council, Council Member Asher. Here. Council Member Atkin. Here. Council Member Davis. Here. Vice Mayor Donahue. Here. Mayor Martinez. Here. Thank you. All right, at this time I will um, invite anyone from the public who'd like to make public comment uh, on any items not on the agenda or on the consent calendar under the purview of the successor agency to the redevelopment agency. Seeing none, we will move on to, the, uh, there are no special orders of the day, and we have the consent calendar. Move the consent Second. calendar. So uh, council oh, member or that. board member or, or <laughs> member <laughs> member Davis made the motion and member Asher uh, made the second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any no's? Any abstentions? That passes by acclamation. There are no action items. We are adjourning this meeting. <laughs> Moving on to the green agenda. And this is the City of Emeryville a regular City Council meeting. Uh, let, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we've got a couple, oh, excuse me, please note that we are all still here. <laughs> and we have a couple of special orders of the day. Um, for the first one, I'd like to bring up Ian Appleyard, the head of human resources. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, tonight we are honoring our employee of the quarter. Uh, this quarter is uh, somebody who you will see when you first come into City Hall. Every time you come in, she will greet you with a smile. And if you're lucky, you'll get a nice laugh out of her, too. It's a real pleasure to ask Courtney Barrett to come on up here for the Employee of the Quarter. And the mayor is going to read some information about you. So come on up. All right, come up. This is your life, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney Barrett, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Emeryville, I am proud to award Courtney Barrett the Employee of the Quarter Award for the fourth quarter of 2015. Courtney started her career with the City of Emeryville as Building Permit Technician slash Plan Checker in the Community Development Department on March 16, 2003. She is responsible for staffing the permit counter, processing building permits, conducting plan checks, and tracking important projects. According to her nominator, Courtney works effectively with applicants and is able to quickly determine concerns and direct applicants to the appropriate resources. She is also adept at providing the public and staff valuable information regarding projects, fees, and administrative processes. Courtney consistently makes independent decisions based on facts and acts in the interest of the city and the department's mission. She also demonstrates a highly motivated attitude, offers exceptional customer service, and brings levity to potentially challenging issues. <laughs> As part of this Employee Recognition Award, Courtney receives an award plaque and a gift certificate to an Emeryville restaurant of her choice. She will also have her picture prominently displayed in City Hall and lunch with the city manager and her department head. Do you want to say any words, Courtney? <laughs> uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to thank everybody. This is a really nice honor. I want to thank um, my boss, the building official, Victor Gonzalez, and my department head, Charlie. Um, it's really been a pleasure working here and serving the city. Um, I really do love it. I love the city. I love uh, helping people, and I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you for your work, Courtney. And 
friends who were giving gratitude to one of our employees and we're welcoming a new employee with our next special order of the day. We are swearing in Officer Duff and I invite Chief Tejada to please come up to and make the introduction. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. This is, as I've said before, one of the, the, the fun things that I get to do. And um, today I'm here to introduce to you and to swear in Ryan Duff. And you may be familiar with that name. Ryan Duff used to work at Emeryville Police Department. I'll give you a little background uh, before. He grew up in Antioch, California. He attended California State University, Hayward, and graduated with a BA in political science. Come on up, Officer Duff. <laughs> After college, Ryan decided that he didn't want to do a boring desk job and became interested in an exciting career in law enforcement. In 2007, Ryan was hired by Emeryville Police Department and sent off to the police academy where he graduated with flying colors. After graduation, he worked with us as a patrol officer working the graveyard shift for six years. Wow. <laughs> he never saw the light of day. <laughs> never saw the light of day. Um, he decided to explore the world outside of Emeryville and then made the move to Concord Police Department. We do know that the grass is not always greener on the other side, and after two and a half years, he really, really missed Emeryville, the people, the department, and his coworkers. It was time for him to come home to where it all started, and it was my pleasure as one of my first hires to welcome him back and um, hire him this, this last month. Today, he is here with his father, uh, over there with the camera. <laughs> um, he's married to the lovely Alicia, and they have three children, a little baby girl who's at home, and they have Wyatt and Harrison. We love those names here tonight to see their dad being sworn in. So I'm going to, uh, and Ryan said that when he's not at work, he enjoys having Star Wars lightsaber battles with the kids, <laughs> trips to the park, barbecuing for the family, and working on cars. And so um, I'm going to swear him in, and then I would like to invite Alicia up. She's going to pin his badge. And so if you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. I say your name. I, Ryan Duff. Do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend. Do solemnly aff affirm that I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That will that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California that I will that I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter upon which I'm about to enter. Right. Congratulations. Officer Ryan Duff. All right. Thank you. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back, Officer Duff. At this time, I'd like to open up public comment for any members of the public who wish to speak on matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council, um, items that are not on the agenda or items that are in the consent items. Mr. Carpio. Good, 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is André Carpio, and I love this type of uh, introduction. Someone who has been sworn for the state and, and United States Constitution, and I have a grievance, of course. <coughs> the discharge of uh, Steve Wesley. A black superintendent, the first one we had here in Emerville, you may not be aware. Uh, he, he was dismissed like a, a chattel, you know, uh, no hearing. And I've been claiming about that the men need a hearing and nobody wants to listen to me. So uh, I, I'm not making any threats here, but the man has to have a hearing. I, I don't care how you do it. And not only that, the British Education Code provides that he has to have a council, and the council has to be in charge of the school district. And here you city councilmen are above the school district, you are above everything. And so you have a duty here to, de to develop and open this case here. Steve Weasley needs a hearing, he is not an animal. I'm sorry, but as long as Steve Wesley is still away from his job, I don't care who the charge. He never had a hearing, and this is a shame. It is a shame. It's a shame, Nora Davis. It's a shame, Ruth Atkin, because you were there at that time, and you never did anything, and this is not the first time in which I claim that the men need a hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpio. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment at this time? Seeing none, is there a city manager's report? Just very briefly. Wait, wait, there's more public. Oh, is there please come up. Uh, if you'd like to pull that item now, we can. This is my first time using We'll pull that. Let's pull that. We'll All right. Uh, sure, Madam Andrew Mayor, Sport. members of the council, um, as you know, we recently had a retirement of our city clerk, longtime city clerk, and so I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our interim city clerk, Nancy Lima, who will be here for the next several months. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Nancy because uh, as a professionally trained uh, city clerk, she has a decades long career in this area and uh, served in statewide uh, offices in her profession. So uh, with that, sh this is her first meeting here with us and um, uh, so bear with us as we try and keep track of everything, but uh, Nancy has already made a huge contribution, so thank you uh, for welcoming her. Welcome. Welcome aboard, Nancy. Do you want to say anything? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, are there any items that uh, anyone would like to pull from the consent items? 6.4 and 6.8. 6 Move the remainder of the consent calendar. Second. So that was Councilmember Davis with a motion, Councilmember Asher with a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? That passes unanimously. So 6.4. Okay, so um, I'm gonna say something really uh, uh, unpopular <laughs> around uh, this uh, resolution to adopt a senior rebate program. Uh, for the Emory Go Round P bid, and um, in looking at uh, various aspects of it, there's three things that someone who's seeking a rebate would need to provide: property tax bill, uh, um, a, uh, some record of who they are, their address, that kind of thing. Um, I, having worked in social services for decades, um, there's usually a distinction between needs-based programs and entitlement programs. And need-based programs are based on financial need. 
And there's nothing, um, the, the assumption made about requesting a senior rebate says um, that for people on fixed incomes, this could be a hardship, but there's nothing in, in what we're proposing that would uh, uh, ascertain uh, any kind of economic hardship. And by virtue of age, some could argue people have had a lifetime to perhaps um, save a lot of money and for whom it wouldn't be a hardship, but then they would be asking for a rebate. So that's my first issue with what we're proposing, is that there's nothing in here that really speaks to economic need. I'd much rather see a rebate program not based on age, but based more widely on economic need for the individual seeking some relief. The second, the second issue that I have with this, um, and I may find myself um, a lone vote on this, uh, against this uh, resolution, um, is that it comes, it isn't a apples to apples kind of thing. It's the, the, the rebate money would come out of the city general fund. It doesn't come out of um, even a transportation fund that's set up to, for the go round or something like that. The way this is written, it's about, um, taking something out of the city general fund for those individuals who are seeking a rebate. So um, I don't know, I haven't had a chance to talk to our legal counsel about this, but one thing that I would like to see maybe, which would make more sense, is to somehow link the rebate to a fund that's connected to transportation in some way. And the one fund that the city can op operates that comes to my mind is the traffic impact fees that are collected from um, developers. So uh, uh, I've been asked tonight, which is whether we could uh, craft this in such a way that the pool of rebate money doesn't come out of the city general fund because that takes away from other operations, but comes out of the, the fees that are directly connected to traffic impact. And obviously the go round has a very close connection to mitigating the traffic congestion in our city. So um, for both those reasons, I can't support this the way it's written. Um, <coughs> and I just wanted to ca catch a get a read from my colleagues about um, either of those uh, of those issues. I have something, a question that's um, maybe tangentially related. It says that EUSD currently has 217 seniors who have applied and been certified to receive their tax exemption. How many total seniors are there in Emeryville, people over 65? Because I think 217 represents a very small um, sliver of that of that population. Does anyone know? <laughs> uh, so you're asking for over 65? Yes. The total is 557. Okay, so there's about half that Correct. apply for and get yes. the exemption? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, on the one hand, um, just to respond to uh, Ruth, um, I I, I hear you about the general fund, although I, I, when I look at how much we'll be spending this evening from the general fund for the general benefit, that amounts to $455,000, and uh, right. $30,000 to me is, is not that much more. Um, the, the idea of opting in and using the program this way is to, I think, um, uh, make sure that we control for staff time and staff work mm -hmm. uh, because EUSD already has this program set up and certainly looking at a wider needs based uh, um, program uh, that we would be going it alone we wouldn't be sharing a list and um, I think that would be really difficult um, I I do hear you maybe on on the traffic impact fee having it come um, from that fund but um, I it, it looks to me like Mr. Gina is, is shaking his head. Um, and so could you could you speak to that for sure. a second? Sure, and um, do you want to jump in, Charlie? 
Sure. <laughs> why, why, why don't I have Charlie start us off, and okay. then I'll jump in yeah. as needed. Thank Thanks. you. I just happen to have here the list of all of the projects that are funded by the traffic impact fee, now known as the transportation facilities impact fee. And all of these impact fees can only be used to pay for explicit projects that are listed in the nexus studies and in the resolution that you adopted when you adopted these fees. And unfortunately, the Emory go round is not on that list. How do there we add it? Well, you'd have to redo the Nexus study, and you'd have to readopt the fee. Um, and I'm. We should add it. Well, <laughs> my understanding is the way we adopted the fees. They, the fees can only be used for capital improvements. Like we, you could use it to purchase a bus yard potentially, or build a bus yard, but you couldn't use it for operating, operating expenses. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, for me, thirty thousand dollars is. Um, uh, is not that much money, especially when we're considering the wider uh, amount, the larger amount of 455 that we see as a as a general benefit. Um, I my understanding though is that well, how often do we re revisit this? Um, that this seems to be um, is it year to year? Is it for the entirety of the P bid? No, they would have to apply yearly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for me, this is something that, that can and should be monitored. It's a new program uh, for us. People have to self-select into uh, the program um, to do it. It seems like it's, uh, you know, I, I do like the idea of mirroring what the school district does um, so that we're not creating a whole new uh, uh, framework um, for this. So I'm... Um, while I, I hear you on these on these issues, um, Ruth, for me, just within the context of the larger amount that we're spending for the general benefit, this doesn't seem like a lot. And I, I want to give seniors the opportunity, if they need it, because not everybody takes it, um, to go ahead and, and get the rebate. But there's nothing in here that says if that shows if they need it. It's just if they want it. Yes. That's true. So, um, but there's nothing that says that if they um, apply that they don't need it, right? We could spend a lot of time trying to certify and verify, um, and um, I, I don't think that that's necessarily going to get us the benefit. We, making the assumption that someone's getting away with something, I just think that thirty thousand um, um, dollars for. Uh, the ability to be able to provide this um, for seniors who who may need it is is a fair exchange. I yeah. also heard from seniors <coughs> that um, said that they wouldn't apply for it because they use the Emory Go Round um, service, and so they felt that it was a they would pay for that. So the the amount of money that someone would be re get a rebate for would be if they own a condo was it 70 something at yeah, the lowest ranges. amount to 141 if they own a house that's within a quarter of a mile that's so, correct so the the app to, to spend time to do an application every year it's not like we 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 would burden them to make it needs base for a small amount of money and the nice thing about a small city is we can be capricious we don't have to be absolutely, uh, you know, just accountable. And we can be efficient in some easy way to do it. And I think this is a, an efficient, easy way. And having it come out of the general fund uh, seems easy to me. You know, it, yes, it's out of the general fund. And I think we can uh, show that we're uh, assisting in the transportation of our citizens to the uh, county <clears throat> and and I think that would be positive in, in the measure BB funds application I think they would look at that positively mayor um, I appreciate uh, what council member action is saying I'm not wildly enthusiastic <laughs> about this particular program, even though I'm old. Uh, but at the present time, if you look at the numbers, uh, we are not talking about a substantial amount of money. We have a relatively uh, 
relatively small population of older of elder people that's going to change the tsunami is coming but we have the ability to institute this program we also have the ability to take this program away if financial conditions change the general fund is under attack et cetera, et cetera. but at the present time i think <clears throat> it's a, a prudent thing to move forward uh, as far as need space you would spend way more money and time on trying to track down you know who has what and what they're doing with it then it would then it would pay us off to 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 do so uh i would move this is this a second reading here or just a resolution nope just a resolution just a resolution i move the resolution i think we can always come back and revisit it at budget time uh in the future and if the statistics change and it becomes an, an a burden that we can't handle well, then we'll address it at that time all I'll right. second the motion we have a motion by member davis and a second by member asher and I, I concur that this is something that we can monitor and revisit, and I, I hear the concerns as well. Uh, should call. we call the roll? Councilmember Asher? Aye. Councilmember Atkin? No, for the reasons I stated. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Vice Mayor Donahue? Aye. Mayor Martinez? Aye. Thank you. Motion passed with Councilmember Davis voting no. Okay, and we have item. I'm sorry, that was Councilmember Atkin voting no. Mm -hmm. We have item 6.8, and we have a member of the public who would like to um, speak on item 6.8. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hilton um, Savage Rochelle, and I. Uh, I've been a resident of Emeryville all of my life, um, 31 years, that's long enough for me to say all of my life. Nonetheless, um, I feel that as a citizen of Emeryville in regards to um, the state safe access, um, being able to have delivery is something that coincides with the whole idea of safe access. Um, I read where within the, um, the laws of Emeryville, you can't operate as a collective. And one of the reasons where people were concerned with robberies and just the odors, et cetera, et cetera, well, having your medicine delivered to you kind of relieves that whole issue. And there are a lot of cost-effective delivery services that help you relieve yourself of that worry of having to form a collective or grow, et cetera, or even worry about somebody robbing your house. I mean, um, the delivery service is extremely discreet. So, I mean, more people know when UPS are at your house than they know if you're receiving medicine. So if you're receiving medicine and nobody knows, then there's no danger to your household. However, if you have to go to Berkeley or Oakland or one of the outer cities and then you come back with whatever your goods are, and um, you're known for it, then mm -hmm. that in my mind would attract attention and the quote unquote robbers, robberies. Um, also, I think it should be re revisited on whether or not the collectives operate, but that's a whole separate um, idea. And yeah, that's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you. And um, just to, from staff, we, we will be revisiting this, um, well, not this specific item, but we will be revisiting delivery, cultivation, um, all sorts of related items to medical marijuana in March. March, that's right. Move approval so. of the second reading. Second. So motion by Davis, second by Asher. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Excuse me, we have another member of the public who wishes to speak, so. Uh, can I jump in and do that? It's Mr. Uh, Carpio. Mr. Gina is okay if I... Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. Please, Mr. Carpio. I just want to mention that on the issue of marijuana, the TNC <coughs> has been subject to a great extent of study. And recently, uh, 
National, no, a national magazine, the like New York Times, uh, published a, a great study about the use of marijuana. And I'm not convinced that uh, the medical marijuana is a sickness or illness solvent. But uh, if uh, the, the council uh, wants to take the liberty of having the Moana delivered there. And <clears throat> I personally have uh, no objection, except that it, the idea that, uh, it, that the medicine is questionable uh, bothers me. And it, there is so much quack medicine all over that if we add another one, uh, it's not going to benefit the public and but you do what what you want uh, but it is, at least you know my opinion and I, i'm not for it thank you thank you mr carpio so we had a motion by member davis and a second by council member asher all those in favor aye aye, aye. <clears throat> any no's abstentions motion passes there are no public hearings tonight, so we move on to item 8.1, which I believe our um, Fire Chief Rocha is here for this item to give us a, a, the 2015 annual report. Need a switch. <laughs> <laughs> and Walter. <laughs> I didn't even know it was Walter. Um, I'm not talking about traffic calls. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just a use. There's there last go back and okay, that's not me, though. We need you to bring it. Oh, that's not you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not the right one. All right. Traffic calming devices usually trouble right us in the front. There we go. There we go. Get out of your way. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, uh, Council and Mayor Martinez. Uh, I'm Dave Roach. I'm the uh, fire chief for the Alameda County Fire Department uh, and, and proud to be the uh, fire chief for the uh, city of Emeryville. And I know each and every person in the Alameda County Fire Department is as well. And uh, Chief Anderson, who's with me, uh, uh, is your liaison or your division chief who's with you on a daily basis and spends quite a bit of time here in the city of Emeryville with staff at each one of the staff meetings and things. So uh, at different points, I could refer to him as, as we go through this evening's presentation. And now I know you're Walter. I think we're, you know him by Walter? <laughs> I'm not, it's true. Okay, I've got to, let's do this. For whatever reason, we're in a PDF format, so this may be a little more difficult. Let me scroll down. <coughs> yeah. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, we're in PDF format instead of a PowerPoint, but that, that works that works just fine. So I'm gonna talk about a few things this evening. One, one is uh, just a general overview of what the Alameda County Fire Department's working in some of my visions, uh, the accomplishments that we've had in this last calendar year and kind of fiscal year. Talk a little bit about the allocation and how our business model works. I think it's always good for everybody to understand that. Um, ACFD's call data and just general information on what the department's doing overall. And then specifically, I think what we're doing in the city of Emeryville and what we've experienced the last year in terms of calls and fire inspectors, fire inspections and emergency management. And we'll have a couple minutes for um, questions and answers. Um, first slide or, or one of the slides is about my vision. And I, and I think it's important to understand um, the Alameda County Fire Department, um, we have a motto, we have a mission statement. That mission statement is quite different than a lot of other traditional fire departments. Nowhere in it does it talk about protecting life and protecting property 
and those sorts of things. It talks about customer service, and that's a really important thing to us, uh, as, especially as a regional agency and one that delivers service to each one of our cities. And it's important to have collaborative relationships, and I think it builds uh, a much stronger organization for us, and we're able to provide better services to each one of our cities from that. We have a strategic business plan that guides us. We do annual planning as well. And of course, we come to each one of our cities or our contract agencies and go through the county budgeting process each year to, to direct us through those things. Um, the organization's got some fiscal strategies that we're dealing with and some challenges ahead of us, much <laughs> like cities, or you all deal with as well when it comes to pensions and costs there and OPEB or retiree medical for us. And we're working on those things and infrastructure as well as replacing those things. And in the unincorporated county, we're working on trying to build, rebuild fire stations and do remodeling and that. And I know here in the city of Emeryville, you've rebuilt or, or done a lot of remodeling at Station 34 out on the peninsula. And that's, we're very happy with the, the remodel. And I know the firefighters there are very, very happy with it as well. So um, capital assets and infrastructure, there's a lot that goes into running a fire department. And one of the things we try to work with each one of our cities is making sure that you're ready and prepared to do that. And usually about every 15 years, you replace fire engines. So one of the great things about replacing fire engines and working with us to replace fire engines is instead of buying one or two uh, in the city of Emeryville er every 15 years, we actually buy three fire engines each year. Uh, we run 35 companies per day in the Alameda County Fire Department. So when we go to uh, purchase engines, you're buying it on an economy of scale sort of thing. So the, the vendor knows us. We're in there every year buying a few, few engines, and you get a better deal when it comes to doing things like that. The enhanced coordination that comes from a large department uh, and us running the dispatch center for the entire region of, of fire departments or most fire departments in the area, and I'm the Region 2 coordinator. Uh, for the fire rescue for California. So that means that fire mutual aid that happens anywhere between Monterey County and the Oregon border along the coastal region comes through our dispatch center, mm -hmm. and, and I'm the, fire, the chief that organizes that. Mm -hmm. So community outreach is something that's really important to us. And this last year, we did a couple creative things, and one of them was done here in the city of Emeryville, and that was a movie night. That was something a little different. We've done two of them, uh, where it's generally just a, it's an open house, and. We invited the kids and the community in to see a movie, and that it was a great experience, I think, at the end of the day, and something new that we're going to try to make sure that we can replicate and do in our other communities as well, but certainly come back to the city of Emeryville in, in the future. Uh, cultural competency training. This has been an issue, I think, just generally in the fire service overall that's challenged the fire service for, for years, and it is a male-dominated profession, and we're, we're trying to make headway into doing that thing nationwide, generally. Uh, the trend is about 4%. The Alameda County Fire Department has about 5% women in, in the fire service, but it goes beyond that and, and into the community and better understanding a much more diverse community that we work in. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, that makes us a stronger and better service provider to the communities that, that we serve. So we've done a number of training things this last year uh, with bringing in outside trainers to help us under, have a better understanding. And then at the end of the day, of course, always the operational readiness and being ready to respond to emergencies and, and, and that readiness that we have and training and doing this sorts of things. And I tell the folks in the Alameda County Fire Department, uh, I don't want to just say that we do it. I don't want to be a facade. I want to make sure that we're able to deliver uh, on the things that, that we have out there or that we say that we can do. Let me try to get, roll through this. So overall, the Alameda County Fire <coughs> excuse me, the Alameda County Fire Department responded almost 40,000 incidents in, in, in 2015. Our dispatch center processed 280,000 calls. Um, our center is a National Academy recognized center, accredited, so that each one of our dispatchers that's in the center does emergency medical management dispatch and also emergency priority dispatch as well for the ambulance service throughout Alameda County. So Paramedics Plus is dispatched by the Alameda County Fire Department today. We're utilizing AVL, which means that based on GPS, you get the closest engine to respond to an incident. So here in the city of Emeryville, that's a little different with only just two units. Um, we're hoping to be able to expand that in the future to actually bring up cities that are nearby. And we're doing it out in the East County today with a little more Pleasanton Fire Department, where we're actually responding the closest unit. So hopefully in the future, as we move forward to working more closely with the city of Oakland and the city of Berkeley, that we could actually expand into doing something like that. Because at the end of the day, when you have an emergency, it really doesn't matter what logo or what person's uniform shows up at the door. So 
Uh, we've logged about 140,000 hours of training throughout the department, and we do task force drills, which means that we, at five times a year, um, we're, we're rotating the crews through, and they come to our training tower and our training center, and they do a lot of hands-on sorts of drills that they have those, and th those are a big one. And they're doing some web-based training, and we've act actually just finished a fire academy this last year, and on February 16th, we have 24 new folks that are starting in our next recruit academy. Accomplishments. We've had a lot of testing this last year, and in many agencies, uh, I think not only in the city and counties and fire departments for certain, um, we're in a state where there's been a lot of changeover and turnover. So um, we have a few, we've, we've had a promotional exam for a number of different positions. Uh, we have over a thousand community outreach events, and I think it's actually closer to 2,000. It's about 1,800. Try to get this one part to close. There we go. Um, did fire station inspections, and fire station inspections are the fire chief rotating by each one of our stations on each shift, and one day we'll look at apparatus, the next day we'll look at the interior of the building, and another day we'll look at the exterior of the building and making sure things are in great shape. We also have a fleet maintenance center, which allows us to work on or be a specialized maintenance center on fire apparatus. Uh, the Alameda County Fire Department does not have 505 uh, apparatus within our department, but we're uh, doing the maintenance on agents for 33 different agencies, including the state of California, mm. for their apparatus. And that allows us, uh, it, it's not necessarily a money maker, it covers its cost, uh, certainly, but it allows us to have some of the best mechanics and the best maintained apparatus in the fire service for in the cer certainly in the area. Um, we had 142 personnel respond out of county on mutual aid. And we did about 28,000 hours uh, this last year of mutual aid, up mainly up into Lake County uh, and providing service. And all of that is reimbursable uh, through the state of California, and we have been reimbursed for that. We get reimbursed usually in about a 90-day window. Um, and speaking, or I mentioned earlier, being a facade and making sure that we could deliver on what we do, um, the sheriff sponsors Urban Shield. Uh, and there is a red command within Urban Shield, and that's designed for the fire service. The Alameda County Fire Department competed in that in three different categories. Urban Search and Rescue, we took first place. Water Rescue, we took first place. And Hazmat, we actually took sixth place. But uh, Hazmat comes with a bit of a, a, a special note. Uh, we had a number of folks who were actually up in Lake County. So the seven people that we planned on sending, we actually didn't send seven, those seven folks. We sent seven folks that happened to be on duty, and we sent two of our volunteers along with them, and we competed one position short. So it, it does come with a bit of an asterisk that goes, goes along with that. We were only a couple points off of being in a much higher number. So uh, we'll be back this next year and ho hopefully won't have uh, out-of-county mutual aid uh, that's going on at the time. Allocation, this part, part of our business model, and this is one of the ways that you save money uh, contracting with the Alameda County Fire Department, is there's cost sharing that goes on. And I think the best example of that is the fire, myself as the fire chief, and, and the city of Emeryville essentially pays 5.7% or five point seven of my salary and benefits, the cost of, of me. And this allows us to spread the cost and save money for each one of our contract agencies. And at the end of the day, have folks that could specialize in certain areas. So Chief Anderson, in addition to being the liaison to your city, is also our special operations chief and, hand, and handles special operations throughout the Alameda County Fire Department. Let's see, is any other? Um, one other thing is, I, as I move to the next slide, um, is I think it's important to also understand how the city is represented. Oops, I seem to lose that. Uh, how the city is represented within the Alameda County Fire Department. When we talk about the 5.7%, five, 5 um, the Alameda County Fire Department is governed by a board of directors. That board of directors is, is the board of supervisors for the county of Alameda. We also have a fire advisory commission that each one of our contract agencies has an, an assigned person that sits on the fire advisory commission. That commission meets on a quarterly basis. Our meeting's coming up here in just a couple weeks. And we also have an executive management oversight committee. The executive management oversight committee are the city managers from each one of the cities, the contract managers from the Berkeley lab and the Livermore lab. Uh, that are on there and the county administrator and that group meets on a quarterly basis as well so our budget as we prepare our budget this next this month that's going to be one of the things we look at is the preparation that's going into our budget and the design of that budget and then we'll come back in may with what's kind of the final budget that we're rolling out to each one of the cities so the 
uh, Mayor Martinez is actually the representative on our Fire Advisory Commission. So she'll have the opportunity to take a look at our budget as we're developing it and bringing it out. So that's part of the governance on how we're set it. And the Board of Supervisors in the unincorporated area has a few, each board member has an appointee that they place on that commission as well. So in the city of Emeryville, there are about 2,253 calls during the year, and there's a breakdown of them. The majority of what we do in the fire service is, is EMS or rescue calls. Uh, there are 18 structure fires. Um, there's a thought out there uh, you hear quite often that the number of fires is actually going down in the fire service. That's not actually a trend that you're seeing nationwide. What you're seeing is a, a huge increase, especially as the population and density increases in EMS calls and, and EMS calls going up. So the Alameda County Fire Department is certainly uh, fitting that need and we, we have a paramedic on every engine or every truck that we staff within the department. We're actually moving toward looking at a venture here in the very new future where we actually may bid on the contract for to be the ambulance provider within the Alameda County for the over the exclusive operating area. So that's something that we're currently working on. Then once again, I already mentioned earlier the remodel of, of Station 34, which uh, the, the crews are very pleased with. And we finally stopped that roof from leaking, which it did for years, and got the clock working as well. <laughs> Uh, fire inspections, about 758 inspections were completed in, the, in, in this last year in the, in the city of Emeryville. Um, our emergency preparedness division, one of those specialized sorts of things that we have a couple of folks that work within it, uh, did some EOC 101 training with city staff. Uh, they've done some training with the council itself and conducted CERT training uh, here within the city and then conducted uh, personal emergency preparedness. And the reason the personal emergency preparedness is important. It's a short course that you could actually get people a lot of times to attend where when you do CERT training, it's not usually the sort of thing that sometimes you can't get folks to commit for multiple days. And we've actually, this last year, changed the format of our training where it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and an attempt to try to get more people to show up to the more in-depth training than just a couple hours. And that concludes my presentation, if there's any questions. There's some questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, thanks for the presentation. It's nice to get a kind of synopsis of what uh, has been happening. I just have a few clarifying questions. Certainly. Um, for the 142 people you send out of county to fi combat the lake fire and yes. whatnot, um, how, is that done on an overtime basis, or how is, that, how is the cost for that? Yeah, uh, so, so essentially it, it does end up resulting at the end of the, the, the firefighters that will initially respond are those that are picked from on duty. Uh, we don't vacate all of our stations at once, so we immediately backfill. And we start to backfill, it is on an overtime basis. So the state of California actually reimburses us at the overtime rate, okay. um, plus about 13% administrative overhead. So we're not making money at the end of the day, but it's certainly covering the cost of doing those sorts of things for us. Um, years ago, thank you. Years ago when we um, uh, started to have women in the Emeryville Fire Department, um, the scuttlebutt was that the medical calls were handled at a whole, just a com, like a really different way, and and the male colleagues were responding very positively to the female paramedics in particular. So I'm just wondering what the um, of the of our two stations here, how many female paramedics we have out of whatever the total is. I think assigned here in the city of Emeryville, there's only one currently. And she was a paramedic, but she dropped that paramedic status. Yeah. Oh. So we, while we have one guaranteed <clears throat> paramedic on every engine, not every person on, on no, the No, I know, I know yeah. that. Yeah. And how many female firefighters? We are at about 23 to 25, I think, currently. Um, there's three in our recruit academy that are coming up as well. But I will tell you that a um, little bit more than the scuttlebutt, uh, it, it does... Uh, make a make a difference and uh, when you're treating a patient uh, or interacting with somebody it's much easier when somebody's looking across at you uh, and, th and there's a comfort level from you know that when right. when they're dealing with somebody and then my last question is um, what are good intent calls good intent calls um, I always use the kind of jokingly the it, it's your neighbor's barbecue um, where mm -hmm. you, somebody called because they thought it was a fire but it wasn't really a fire. It was smoke coming off of a barbecue or something like that. That's, it's just, there was good intent. It's not, it's not a malicious sort of false alarm 
but uh, somebody legitimately thought there was an emergency. Thank you. Any other questions? I just have a question about um, cost projections going forward. I realize that it's not so easy to do that kind of thing, but is there something you could say about cost projections in relation to the cost of living? Is the cost of Alameda County Fire Service going to be greater than the cost of living, less than, or? Yeah, we, we always try to stay, I think, as we develop our budgets um, in, in that area of, of the, the normal consumer price index or co a cost of living. Um, our current budget or our current cost to the city of Emeryville is about $5.7 million, the annual contract um, that we have for service. Um, this next year, the budget is going up a little bit more than what I would say probably the cost of living is. Uh, with our projections that we have right now, but we've, we've still got some time to move through the budget process uh, and we're trying to sharpen our pencil as much as possible. Um, but, but much like uh, many agencies, um, it's back to that kind of the, the, the pension and we do a salary survey. So our firefighters are paid based on the average of 12 different agencies. Uh, that average is going up a little bit more th this year. Um, our pension costs, we're still under 30%, we're at 28%, which uh, when it comes to public safety, that's a very good number uh, when it comes to CalPERS. So, so there are some challenges and we're, we're trying to keep it down, but, but the things that are moving are health care and, and pension on us. Yeah, I, I just have a comment. Thank you for that report. It was very comprehensive. But I also want to thank Alameda County Fire for the way they handled their response time during the time the Peninsula Station was being re re rehabbed and rebuilt. Uh, there was no diminution of service, and I really appreciate that, and the people of this city really appreciate it. So kudos to everybody who was involved in that. Yeah, thank you. It, di it, did, it did work well for a short period of time. Exactly. <laughs> I, it was uh, quite crowded at Station 35 <laughs> during the repair period. <laughs> yes, it was. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Would you um, be able to provide any more information or any updates to our our um, ambulance provider contract? As you mentioned, um, yes. that you may have an opportunity to right. pit, make a pitch to be our provider. But what's happening with Paramedics Plus? When is the contract up? Can you just give us a little more information? Certainly. So um, the Paramedics Plus contract for service was a five-year contract for service when they, when they started with the ability for it to be extended by an, another five years. That term is coming up at the end of October of this year. Um, this last year, the Board of Supervisors extended that contract by six months with the option to extend it by two, three-month periods. Uh, Paramex Plus was having some financial difficulty, um, in, at least being financially stable within the Alameda County market. Um, so they, they, at this point, uh, are likely to bid the contract or look at bidding the contract uh, again. Um, the Alameda County Fire Department, our interest in doing it is we, we have the ability to um, claim some federal supplemental um, inc revenue. Uh, that's available to us as a public agency if we were to get into the transport business. Um, so we're looking at that. The Board of Supervisors in December uh, gave us authorization to move to what was phase two of our, of our financial study or feasibility study to look into doing that. So at this point, um, the Alameda County Fire Department is in a position to, uh, we're awaiting the RFP or the request for proposal for ambulance transport to go out. As soon as that comes out, we plan on assessing that at a very close level, uh, and then actually engaging in conversation uh, with large private ambulance providers. So that will likely mean, or will mean, Paramedics Plus, uh, American Medical Response, um, and then Falk Ambulance, and, and I don't think there are any other large ones that are in, in this area, but we'll engage in a conversation with them, and, and essentially we're gonna look at one of the models, or one of the four models we're looking at, is possibly subcontracting with them and where we would become the license holder hmm. they would provide transport under us we would take over billing and do a number of other things so you'd be able to take uh, to take advantage of those federal funds and we'd at the same time exactly have to access to a fleet that's pre-existing um, as long as we're talking about ambulance service um, there's something coming out of my day job not my elected job uh, that I'd like to um, uh, kind of put in, put in the hopper here is um, 
My program gets involved a lot with disputed ambulance bills after the fact for Medicare beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there's been one company in particular um, has been going after the beneficiary um, and overcharging beyond what Medicare would cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, it would be, uh, it would behoove the county to include in this RFP some kind of billing appeals process that, that um, someone who's being transported can do after the fact. Right. And, and I'm not sure that that's currently available. Yeah, and it's just um, one of the things I didn't clarify is the Alameda County Fire Department, we're a dependent special district. So when we bid on, we will bid on, or hopefully bid on the contract once the board gives us authorization to do that. But we do not have um, input at this point or involvement in the design of the RFP. So um, that would be a conflict of interest for us to be directly involved in that. But, but I certainly understand what you're saying, and billing needs to be normal and customary, and there also needs to be a compassionate billing uh, as well. There's gotta be an appeals process. There needs to be, yes. Yeah. So I, I have one more question. I was wondering if you might, and this might be asking you to look into a crystal ball a little bit, um, just like Scott's question about financial forecasting. But in terms of the stability of the pool of contracted agencies, um, what's your sense in terms of um, when contracts are coming up for renewal, how the cities are feeling? Are, um, are you exploring um, new agencies to uh, bid through? You know, just wondering, because that, to me, when I look at the budget, that's that seems to um, have the greatest impact on what each of the the contract agencies are paying. Yes, it certainly it certainly can, and um, can, the, through the, the contracts for service, or some folks refer to them as consolidations, could have a, a large impact, or could, depending on on the magnitude or the size of the agency that's coming. I, I think at this point, um, all of the cities and, and the laboratories are stable. In our contracts, we're working through renewing the contracts today with the city of Newark and the city of Union City. Uh, the approval was done, actually, their five-year mark was last year in, in July. So uh, we're still working through some of the things in the contract. Um, and um, the OPEB or the, the other post-employment benefits is a big issue that they um, everybody has concern at. And we're, we're trying to address that when I talk about trying to address some of we get our fiscal house in order and that, and that's one of the things I know those two cities had concern on, um, but they recognize that they do have a current liability in it as well, and we're working out some of the language related to that. Well, I'm glad to see we'll, we'll be at the top of another five-year cycle with them. <laughs> and I do know that your city manager has already uh, told us to start working on that contract for 2017. So we need to have some dialogue there, but what we're trying to do is work through with the city of Newark and the city of Union City so that we have a lot of the work and the template kind of done so that when we turn to come to the city of Emeryville, mm -hmm. that, that a lot of that's work's done rather than having, trying to work on three contracts at the same time. Very good. And any more questions? No. Well, thank you very right. much, thank Chief you. Rocha. I'm, I will, coming, I will um, allow the, a member of the public to speak at this time, but thank you, Chief Rocha. This is an area I did request uh, last meeting or the meeting before. There was a Alameda man who drowned because the fire department, <coughs> from my understanding, the report from the media, the fire department uh, didn't have the authority to go rescue the man. And so it, it disturbed me that we have people here who are uh, specialize in rescue and they couldn't do and so for whatever reason uh, I never understood the conflict that was happening there before the county and the city and the police but it disturbed me and the next area I also want to explore is see if we have any boat to go rescue someone who, who is in a bay because sometimes waiting for the coast guard to come up it's a it's a long way and if the sea is is bad then uh, it's also a longer way and i was wondering if if we have any rescue boat that that will ready to jump on and start and go see what's happened and then and, and I, I don't know if, if anything happened but i did mention 
mentioned that last time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpio. We actually do have a rescue vessel, and that was, I assume that's what we used to place number one at Urban Shield. That is true. We do have a uh, water rescue uh, team, and basically our primary boats are located in San Leandro at stations 10 and 11. And here at station 34 on the peninsula, we have a training boat. It's an IRB that folks have been trained on this past year. Chief Winokur is actually in charge of that division underneath me. Um, and we have about now 15 of 18 folks trained to a water rescue status where they can go out on that boat. We do have limitations where they don't necessarily go out too far at this point because it is a smaller vessel. But they, in fact, can go around the peninsula and rescue any folks uh, as long as they, we have two people on that boat. We currently have no less than four or five a day out here in Emeryville at any given time. Um, we do plan on, hopefully within this next year, having a boat here staffed daily um, by hopefully the end of 2016. That is our, our goal. So. Okay. Thank you, Chip. Uh, you're welcome. All right. There's actually no action to be taken on this item, although it's under action items, so we can move on. There is uh, nothing listed under city as housing successor. And under communications and reports, I believe our planning director has uh, something to report. Yes, I do. Uh, this is my report on the Planning Commission's most recent meeting, which was last Thursday, January 28th, 2016. As you know, there is currently one, vacant, one vacancy on the commission, and Chair Gunkel had an excused absence during the first part of the meeting uh, and arrived about 7.30. So there were five commissioners present and voting for the first four items. The first item was the general plan annual progress report. The commission approved this unanimously with some minor modifications, and it will be coming to the council on March 1st for your consideration of approval in time for us to submit it to the state by the due date, which is April 1st. The second item was a Sutter Health sign appeal at 2000 Powell Street. The commission unanimously voted to dismiss this appeal. This was a uh, sign that was approved by staff under a master sign program. The council unanimously voted to dismiss the appeal based on a determination that the facts ascertainable from the record did not warrant further hearing. And the commission's action on this item is final and may not be further appealed to the city council. The 2100 Powell Street Master Sign Program was approved on a four to one vote with Commissioner Cardoza voting no. Uh, he indicated that he did not like the proposed relay health signs, which he felt were unnecessary advertising signs. Uh, the other four commissioners did not agree with that. Uh, the 3706 San Pablo Avenue affordable housing project uh, unanimously was approved for a one year extension. And finally, the commission held a second study session on the 6701 Shellmount Street residential project, the Anton project, commonly known as the Nady site. They were generally satisfied with the design with a few minor suggestions for improvements. The 2100 Powell Street Master Sign Program and the 3706 San Pablo Avenue time extension are both appealable to the City Council within 15 days, and that would be by 4 p.m. next Friday, February 12th. If the council wishes to vote to appeal either of these items to yourselves, this would be the time to do that. Charlie, why is 3706 extended for a year? They are seeking funding. Uh, they've been very diligently pursuing a number of different funding sources, and they almost have the funding that they need, but not quite. And so they need this extension so that they can put their funding together. And in fact, an item related to that will be on your next agenda. Have they indicated whether they need the full year or is that padded? They No, they probably don't need the full year. It's just standard to do it in one year increments. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, reports from department heads? When's the skate park opening? We're hoping in the middle of March to have a ribbon cutting. <laughs> Some um, people think the it's The weather's helped now. the contractor up a little bit, but they're, they're working on landscaping right now. I think next week the plants go in. So we're, we're getting close. It's, it's been tested by some local skaters. I've seen it in action Quite already. a bit. Quite a bit. Hard to keep them out. They yes. keep it clean, too. Yeah. 
All right, um, I, is there anything from my colleagues on council? I just want to um, give thanks to the mayor for, and um, city staff for getting a letter down to San Luis Obispo really quickly last week. Um, uh, this regards a very important decision that the county planning commission is going to be making this Thursday about Phillips uh, 66 refinery and the transport of the volatile crude um, through uh, major urban areas, including ours, by rail. And we were, we've were we been on record against the transport of um, this volatile crude, pet coke, other hazardous materials. And um, uh, so they're expecting um, public hearing to perhaps go more than one day for public comment. But Thursday is going to be a big, big day to see whether we can keep this stuff off our uh, off our rails and in that um, vein I just wanted to say they got very little uh, news coverage four tankers derailed a couple of weeks ago in Martinez there was no leak or spillage but they don't know why those four cars derailed so um, you know once again you know how many more de derailments or uh, Quebec style fires that kill people do we have to have before this stuff stops? I mean, it's, you know, the fire department probably knows better than anybody what kind of hazardous materials pass through our city every day, but, but um, it's, uh, uh, I'm hopeful um, this won't be approved, but any kind of public pressure would be appreciated. Great, and I just wanted to um, mention the bike share planning workshops that are happening on Thursday, February 11th here in City Hall Council Chambers at 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. So uh, for those of you who don't know, bike share is expanding, Emeryville is being included in that expansion, and we are trying to decide on the location for um, these pods here in Emeryville. So your, uh, your input is welcome here at City Hall on Thursday, February 11th. 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. I hope um, folks watching from home will be able to make it down. Any other council member items? 10.3, council members reporting on meetings attended. So I, I want to thank my colleagues for allowing me to go to the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, two weeks ago. I had the honor of representing the city of Emeryville. And um, for those who don't know, the U.S. Conference of Mayors is a group. It's the official nonpartisan organization of um, larger cities, creating a forum in which mayors can share ideas and information, and also develops it promotes the development of uh, national policy. Um, tries to encourage the um, the federal city relationship and um, it's a group of folks who are tri striving to ensure that federal policy meets urban needs. So um, uh, one really great meeting I got to attend was the Standing Environment Committee um, and Gina McCarthy, who's the administrator of the EPA, spoke and she talked about the Clean Power Plan, which is basically, um, it's our nation's first ever set of national standards that address carbon pollution from power plants. Um, and uh, that was, it was great to hear about that, but what people were really interested in was Flint, Michigan, and she didn't shy away from answering questions about that. And later that very same day, she accepted the resignation of the um, the region head there in um, Chicago and and um, Flint so it was it was very nice to actually be able to be right in front of her and have her ear as this uh, crisis was happening um, I also brought to her attention um, because I, I'm this person in the audience so who's who would like to ask a question I would um, and I did um, ask her about the EPA's role in uh, whether or not coal would be transported out of Oakland, and she um, reaffirmed that uh, the EPA would, as they have been, um, making it a priority that uh, that to make sure that environmental impacts are considered and well analyzed. And I hope they will keep that promise as we go forward, because I, I don't um, believe that coal was always on the table as what was going going to go through um, the Port of Oakland. So I was able to bring that up, and um, I, I hope that that uh, was heard. Um, 
We also got to hear Michelle Obama speak on ending veteran homelessness, um, which is, uh, she created a mayor's challenge a year ago, and there, there are a few cities that actually were able to get their veteran homeless level down to zero uh, in the last year, which was an incredible feat. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's one of the, I felt the benefits of um, attending this conference was getting to network with the mayors who have, have achieved these kinds of feats, and I think that was I wrote it down. It's Phoenix was one of the cities, um, Salt Lake City, um, but it, it was it was a major challenge, and it just showed what um, local government can do and the part that they can play in um, these big, greater national challenges. And uh, let's see, oh, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, and New Orleans got down to zero. So uh, another. Um, benefit of going to the conference was connecting with folks at the White House. Of, of course, President Obama uh, spoke and addressed all of us as well, but um, I didn't get to network with him. I did get to network <laughs> with um, folks with the Small Business Administration, including the, the administrator, the, the head there, Maria Contreras Sweet, and she um, was sweet enough to offer her assistance in um, getting back to me to, to uh, help out and find out what assistance uh, Emeryville could get from the the Small Business Administration. So I hope that will be a fruitful connection and she's already um, followed up with me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting more information from those folks. But again, thank you to my colleagues for allowing me to go. I almost got snowed in, but I didn't. So the, the flights right after me got canceled and um, I made it back uh, safe and sound and um, with just a little bit of snow on me. And yes. we should probably say, Nora, that we attended a meeting in West Oakland with a group of people concerned about the border between Emeryville and West Oakland. The group's name is Under the Maze. And Caltrans, being a landowner, was also present at that meeting. And we will be meeting with members of that group again coming up very soon. Yeah, the follow-up meeting is Thursday at 12.30. We'll be meeting with uh, some of the staff people from Oakland just to see <clears throat> where we could work together. The, this is a serious problem, the, the, uh, both the under, under the maze and at the 36th Street entrance to Emeryville. And uh, if we can work together targeting these problems, uh, I think it will be very helpful to both cities. And was this under the purview of the Public Safety Committee? Well, or? how did it come? Well, we were uh, invited to come to this group, so Nora and I decided it could, uh, it could only be two of us. Mm -hmm. Right. We had an interest in this southern border of our city, and we, we and decided to And clearly uh, that in, it, it involves public safety and certainly public health which uh, we haven't pulled in yet, but I feel strongly that we should pull in the county public health because there are some real problems with the, the waste that's, that's down there, the human waste. So uh, we're, we're continuing to work on that. Thanks for bringing that up. Scott. Also, mosquito abatement is very interested in that area because a lot of water pools there exactly. and the mm. Treatment plant has a lot of mosquito issues, and oh. so these these areas that are sort of not well covered because a lot of them are behind fences need mosquito abatement needs access to these areas. Well, I have to hand it to you, Scott, for being the first person who said Zika virus to me ever, and now it's at the top of every headline. So it's, <laughs> I think people will be taking mosquito abatement very seriously this year. Uh, Scott, can you uh, ask your mosquito abatement group to give us some further information about that in Alameda County? Uh, yes, we. Good. Our group is very concerned with the mosquito that carries that disease, and it that mosquito is in Southern California and in the Central Valley, but it has not made it yet to Alameda County. And then um, just to thread the needle with the Under the Maze group, I was wondering if um, staff would be able to add an agenda item to the Public Safety Committee, just so we, we have on record you know, what's going on and what 
what advice is being given, if there's any work to be followed up on at the council level. Thank yes. you. And I think that is it for the evening, unless somebody has any community advisory body vacancies to announce. This is a record. Good for you, Diane. <laughs> All right, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>